Uh, I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, in really in like the Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, before it was a Silicon Valley. Um, my dad was a, my parents are not in agriculture, my dad was a furniture mover. Um, and the reason I'm in agriculture is, so I actually went to college because somebody told me to apply, uh, fill out an application. So I filled out an application. And I was supposed to go to Berkeley and study biology. And I went to, back in those days, the campus dormitories were impacted, so not every freshman got a dorm. So I didn't get a dorm. So I went to Berkeley about this time my senior year in high school to try to figure out where I was going to live. And it was the first time I went to that city projecting this is where I'm going to live. You know, everybody visits different places and you visit it as a visitor. You don't visit it as like, I'm gonna be a citizen here. And it was absolutely a super negative experience for my vision of I don't wanna live here. Um, so that Monday morning, I petitioned the University of California can I not go here? Can I go somewhere else? Back in those days, it was a hell of a lot easier than I know it is today. Um, they said, sure, you can go to Davis for two years to do your, do your general education, and then you have to come back to Berkeley. So when I got to Davis, I discovered there was no plant science major at Berkeley. So I changed my degree to plant science. And voila, I woke up this morning here. So I <laughs> have no agricultural background whatsoever. So if there's folks here that don't have an ag background, it is absolutely possible to get into the business. Um, so I graduate real quick, just so, so I graduated from Davis, and I've basically been earning my professional. Uh, my entire professional life, I've been in the fresh produce business, most of the time in the strawberry business. Um, I worked for different companies over the years, and then about, oh, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago, I started my own company. Um, that company is now morphed into uh, a whole different things, but the, this label you've seen here, Good Farms, is I'm a partner in a company called Andrew and & Williamson, and that's uh, the company that I am a partner in today. Uh, what we do, and I'm going to kind of talk about that as the business of, of our business, but we both grow fresh produce and sell it. Um, those are two very, very different businesses. Um, but we grow, the, our vast majority of our products, we grow raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and strawberries, both organically and uh, conventionally, uh, pretty much 365 days out of the year. Um, does anybody have any relatives from out of state? Yes, no? Tell, name a city. Chicago. Chicago, so there'd be Jewel Food Stores, Costco, um, we sell them. Where else? Wegmans. So that's, Wegmans was the name of the grocery store, which is in upstate New York, or mostly upstate New York. Anywhere else? North Carolina. So that's like Food Lion Country big time, Kroger. Um, these are banners of grocery store chains that we, uh, we so, so we used to do a lot of Piggly Wiggly business back in the day. We don't as much anymore, but we used to sell a lot of Piggly Wiggly. So the, the idea, uh, and then what about, uh, so, so everybody's ever heard of a Olive Garden? Uh, Red Lobster, Seasons 52, um, Panera, um, actually now Chick-fil-A. Um, those are all um, venues that you would see our products in. Um, so uh, the reason I say that is just to give a feel for where we, where we send our products. Um, and then we farm up and down the state of California along the coastline and then all over Mexico in the middle of winter, sort of around the city of Guadalajara, and then um, up and down the Baja Peninsula as winter turns into spring, and then as spring turns into summer, we go up the California coastline. Yes? So you more food service focus or retail focus? So, uh, we're berry growers is the vast majority of our products, so about, 90% of berries are sold retail. So it, we're very retail focused. We do do a lot of food service business, but because of the nature of the products we grow, our relationships are very 
deep with retail. And we're gonna kind of go over that because it's real important how how the process works. But but um, I see you have a foxy hat on, which is a ve big vegetable grower, and they they tend to be almost the opposite, where most of a uh, big majority of vegetables go through food service outlets. And that's gonna get into, we're gonna talk a little bit about elastic and inelastic demand and the effects that has in the in the business side of the business of, of farming. So I can't even remember how I'm supposed to run this damn thing, but we'll try. So, no, down. There we go. So how do I activate that? Somehow or another. Oh, here, here, I get it. I can figure it out. So the title of this is how to turn berries into money, right? So, so really. There are, oh, no, now I can't move it forward. You guys can see that I didn't study electronics. So now if I do that, will it, there we go. So there's really, in, in the fresh berry business and in the vegetable business, there's really two parts to the fresh part of, of agriculture. There's the sales and marketing side, and there's the production side. Oftentimes when somebody joins our firm, the, one of the very first questions we'll ask them is, you know, where do you feel you want to go? Do you want to go into the sales and marketing side, or do you want to go into the, to the, um, to the production side? So the, in, in today's world, um, and we're going to talk about that in depth, but, but the, the sales and marketing side is basically the folks that interface and plan with large retail and food service customers. Questions? Okay. Oops, wrong way. So then there's the production side. So now is, are most of you guys... Let me get a little... That's what it's like all day, every day. <laughs> Are most of you guys interested in the production side? Yes, no, anybody interested in the sales and marketing side? I got one hand, more than one, two, maybe? Yeah, okay. Production side, what, like, in, in the production side, are, what's everybody like, oh, I wanna be a farmer, I wanna be a researcher? <laughs> You want to be a farmer, okay? I want to be also on the marketing side. On the marketing side, all right. Anybody else? Plant breeder. Plant breeder. You want to be in the money. <laughs> Anybody else? Researcher. Researcher, okay. Well, similar to plant breeding, but uh, in disease side or in the uh, weeds. Weeds, weed science, okay. Anybody else? It's, it's interesting in ag today, um, well, I'm gonna stimulate some conversation, but, but uh, I think what I, if I had an ask of this discussion, I would appreciate if you guys take in what I'm gonna tell you about the production and business side of agriculture and use it as a map to do exactly not that for the future because we're we're in a place in agriculture today that if you do what I did then like go change your major because it's a real bad idea so it's it's actually a really exciting time in agriculture it's so it's interesting I, I actually have a kid who went to school here until a few weeks ago um, and I encourage none of my children to study ag because I don't have any idea why anyone would ever want to. Um, but uh, I would say in the last two to three years, it, it, it is absolutely the most, one of the, I can't imagine a more exciting place to position yourselves for the future. Um, has anybody been over to the Strawberry Technology Center? Yeah? Does anybody, what companies share that building? Amazon Webster. What was that again? Amazon Webster. That's interesting. None of you find it odd that Amazon is sitting over in that building? 
Federal Technology Park. Think about that. I'm serious. Think about that, right? What you does? They, raise your hand if anybody thinks Amazon is stupid. Right? And why are they over there? They're over there because they want to be with you guys. Because the future of feeding the world is exactly how I'm going to not show you how to do it. So it's really, really an exciting time. Super exciting. So i got to be honest with you guys. I can't remember how this goes. Oh, hold on. All right. So, so we're going to... Um, I'm going to kind of go all over the place, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons I'm saying about that, you, that it's a good idea not to pay attention to what I'm going to tell you is because we're going to kind of break down ag, current ag, and I'd like to kind of have some discussions with you guys about as, we, as you see current agriculture from a, cur, uh, from, a, from a practitioner, then I kind of want to talk a little bit about where your guys' visions and what you guys see and why you're here and all that. So understanding costs. So the first thing I hope the next slide is, okay, I'm going to talk a whole ton about the cost of agriculture. Before I do, I want you guys to explain to me why it's absolutely not important that I explain it to you. Why isn't it important that you understand the cost of agriculture. Yes? Is it because it's always changing? Because the market kind of influences? Ooh, you're going down the, ah, what was that again? The market influences it. Right. Supply and demand. Right. The what, said again? Supply and demand. Supply and demand. So do I grow a branded product? Does anybody grow a branded product? Name a branded product in the food business, in the fresh food business. Right. The they, they'd love to, well, yeah, even then, um, they'd love for it to be, but most consumers don't recognize branded product. They're trying real hard. Yeah, they have like a QR barcode, bar, like barcode where you can like see what variety you're eating now. Mm -hmm. So like consumers can technically like buy off variety if they really wanted to. Try to, but, but, they're, but they are trying. But the most important thing that I'm trying to get at is it's a commodity business. So does the customer care what it costs? You guys, this is going to be one of the long ass 45 minutes if none of you answer. Does the customer care what it costs? Yes. What, they do? The customer cares. How would I care? Well, who's the customer? Oh, who's the customer? So I'm a farmer. Who's the customer? The person who writes you a check. Who writes me a check? The distributor, the, the ship buyer, shipper. Good. We're getting close. So, I'm a, so remember, so there's two sides of the business. There's the grower shipper part that we talked about. You said you might be interested in, right? And there's the farming part. Both of us sell to who did we talk to? We're we're in upstate New York. Chains. Wegmans, Safeway. Do they care? Oh no. Oh no. Go ahead. They want to pay you as little as possible. Absolutely. For as much as Absolutely. They care. They care that you don't make as much money as them. So do they care what it costs me to grow? Oh, no, they don't give a hoot about you. Right. <laughs> Right. So it's a commodity business, right? And I'm going to talk about costs, but the most important thing to know is your customer doesn't care because they are in the business, except for one chain, they're in the business of buying for as little as they can and selling for as much as they can, right? And there is a long, anybody here saying ag economics? You're all biologists. She's like, she's like, she's like, she's like, ag business, sorry. Ag business. Okay, so there's a long, long history. I'm only going to say, oh, maybe in the thousand-year venue, maybe longer, of 
costs being driven out of agriculture, like, like the, pro the producer not being tied to the actual end cost, right? So, so there's a super long history of a big separation. And I'm not, I'm not, anyway, we'll get there, right? So it's not important because ex except for Costco, and we can talk about that in a little bit, Every other chain's job is to buy low, sell high. And there's a super, super, another about 800 to 1,000 year history of farmers replacing each other. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why that happens too. But, so I farm until I don't have any money and I go out of business and there's some idiot who takes my place and calls Costco right after me, well not Costco, bad, calls Safeway right after me and takes my place, right? because it's a commodity business. So the gist of it is ag agricultural prices have nothing to do with wholesale prices. So, so let's talk a little bit about the farming part. So you can't see this, but I, unfortunately, because I'm not a lecturer. So let me, let me this, this is a sample company for strawberries, and this could be in Santa Maria, which is just right down the street from you guys. And this is a, a sample budget for 100 acres of strawberries. So if it's me, now we're talking about, I'm over here on the production side. Joe Farmer, I'm gonna start tomorrow. And if, again, you guys have questions, raise your hand. So, or just shout. So, um, I, uh, Ernie Farley, wanna grow strawberries tomorrow. I wanna get in the business, never grown strawberries in my life, which was me 30 years ago, right? Dad was a furniture mover. So, here's the production costs for 100 acres of strawberries. It's only just the production. I'm not picking them yet, right? All I'm doing is growing the plants. That's gonna cost $44,500 uh, $44, an acre. So I'm gonna have to come up with four and a half million dollars in order to do this. But I haven't picked a box yet, right? So then when I pick the boxes, that's gonna cost me another $8.3 million to do that for a total of 12 and a half million bucks. Eh, 13 million bucks, right? The cost, the farm, actually this is a perfect, <laughs> this is a perfect example, because can anybody see what the, does anybody know who studied, said they studied uh, ag business? Does anybody know what farm margin means? Now I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, I means like how much money did the farm make? Uh, so you're saying like their portion of the dollar? How much did the, uh, the margin that the farm made, like I paid all my costs, here's what I made. In this budget, it's zero. So, um, but again, there is light at the end of this tunnel. So, we're gonna pay, this farming sample company is gonna pay another company a million bucks to sell it. And we're gonna to get to those discussions in a minute, right? Two different pieces. Production, sales, right? So, it's going to generate about, well that can't be right, huh? Because that, that's, how can sales be 12.7 and costs be, oh, costs are 12.7. All right, I did my math wrong, huh? Did I just say 13.7 or 12.7? 12.7. Yeah, all right. So it's breaking even, but, but it's throwing off a million bucks to another company that's gonna sell it. So, so the reason this is important is, is in the agricultural business, if you're selling Wegmans or Costco, what's the number one thing you have to have if you're gonna sell them? What was that? Right. It's a real bitch to sell a retail chain, something you don't have. What's the number one thing, uh, you guys don't know, but I'm gonna ask. If you're in the retail chain business, you can make a lot of mistakes. What's the number one thing you can't, admit? I mean like people get fired over it. What's the one thing you can't have? If I'm, if I'm Safeway, there's a Safeway here in town probably, right, or a Vons? I don't know, Vons, okay, same company. If, if I own Vons, what's the number one thing I can't have? Right. If you go in for 
artichokes at Vaughn's and there's no artichokes, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the next store. So it's extremely important in the supply side and the demand side of the business that you have order fulfillment. Walmart calls it OTIF. Order, I've got to figure this out now. Order something in full. Order o OTIF. What would that be? How come I'm screwing that out? Order something in full. But the whole, you, as a supplier, we get scored on making sure that every single order gets filled. So that every, sing, that every order gets filled and that means the shelves are full and the customer can buy them. And that doesn't sound that difficult, but if you're you, selling them a product that goes bad in six days and they're a five, four day truck ride away, it gets complicated really fast. So one of the reasons that I wanted to bring this up is, so you can see these production costs. The, these are the costs per acre, and this is where we're going to have this discussion. Ranch overhead, which is like the people we pay, the, the, the folks like you guys will be when you graduate, that's ranch overhead. Folks that are running this business, fumigate land is three grand, plants are four grand. Weed, weeding is 10 grand, Fumig fertilization and pest control seven grand, an acre, right? So we've gotten, we've gotten to the point where we have really, 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 really high costs of, for, of production agriculture, pretty much in the West. Doesn't really matter whether it's in Mexico or in California, Arizona, Oregon, Washington. We, we're really good at producing fresh products for pretty much North America. The issue we have is, it's kind of where everybody else likes to live. So the costs in our business have, have gone up really drastically. This 44,000 bucks an acre for production costs, if I was giving this talk 10 years ago, 12, maybe 14,000 bucks an acre, that's the, the changes that have happened. And in agriculture, there's really three things you need. Does anybody know what the three things you need to farm something? One's gonna be what? Water. Water. Oh, money, yes, that's, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you, A. <laughs> right, right, right. Water, what else? Land, and then what else? Labor. Labor. So, water, land, and labor. West coast of North America. Water's prolific as hell, right? We got all the water we need, right? No, okay, so land. There's a ton of land, right? We can buy it cheap. And labor, well, that's super simple, right? There's tons of people, right? So that's, if, if we were to pull out those three things in this, you'd see, and the reason I'm saying this is, remember, you guys are the ones that have to come up with the ideas. The, all of these costs are based on those three things. The, this system that delivers good food, but it's based on lots of land, lots of water, lots of labor, right? The three things that no longer exist. Now, now granted, well, the exact same thing is on the buying side too, right? When you go into a Vons, you certainly expect if you can't find the pepper, you expect somebody to be there. If you sit in line for three deep, you get pissed, right? It's the exact same thing, right? Labor. Everybody says migrant farm worker, right? Our turnover rate is probably 10% of what most retail chain stores turnover rate is. And turnover rate means losing employees constantly. We have a much more stable labor force than the average grocery store, grocery store chain. So, we're going to take this million dollars. So, so this is the farming part if you want to get in the business, right? You're going to take the, this million bucks is going to another company, which is the sales company, right? And we do both. And I don't think this is going to be much more than, fling. okay. So that million bucks in commission is going to go into a business that's really going to be, so, so the farming part we're, we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth. Then you're now going to talk about the sales part. Well, so the sales part is the one that's interfacing with the customer. So again, what's going to be really, so let's just use strawberries. What's really important if you're going to the grocery store? Out of stock, got that one. What else? Quality. Quality. 
Yep, big time. What what grocery stores grocery stores will call quality? They'll they gauge quality in several different metrics. One is what they call D and D, destroy and dump, or dump and destroy. Basically, throw it away because it's a perishable commodity, right? So it's very important for them. How much am I buying? How much am I selling? How much am I throwing away? What else is it? What are some of the other attributes of quality? Size. Size. Color. Color. Shelf life. Shelf life. Taste. Taste. Right? So now, now I'm on a whole different side of the same business. Right? But now instead of growing it, I'm the person standing in front of this customer who's saying, I want all of those things you just said, and I just all I want them for is Wednesday. Oh, it's today Wednesday. All I want them for is Thursday. When, when, when part of my job is I go in and meet with retail customers all the time. And every time I go in, they say they want 100% stock, they want really high quality, big size, high flavor, but just one day a year. Go ahead. How much do grocery stores care about flavor in relation to other things? Because Good question. If you, if you get it to a customer, it's already sold, right, by the time they're tasting it? Good question. So I'm trying to battle whether, let's just go with that. So I'm the grocery store, since we're trying to learn the business. So the question is, do I care about flavor? The answer is hell yes, right? Why, of course, right? All right. Um, but the size is half the size of the other one. Now, do I care about flavor? But, but I, I can only get that in the month of August. Do I care about flavor? Uh, I get really high throwaways, but it's really sweet. Do I care about flavor? Um, the, the fruit has a lot of scarring and stuff. It's not as pretty, but do I care about flavor? So the answer, first of all, is if I'm in the retail grocery business, do I care about flavor? Yes. Not yes, hell yes. <laughs> right? But if you don't give me all those, this company doesn't give me all those things, I don't really give a shit about flavor. Right? But I really do. And if you can deliver it, it's a really big deal. But if I don't have completely stocked, perfect, 12 month out of the year, not 12 month, 52, you know, it's not 365, but it's pretty close to 365 days out of the year product. That's also, we forgot about safe, you know, product, then, then I don't really care. So the, the, the problem is in the decision making, it's not a problem. The opportunity is in the decision making matrix, flavor can be is lower than, and you know who does that? You know, whose fault is that? It's not the grocery store. Whose fault is that? Yeah, okay. you got, don't blame the grocery store. Yeah. Aren't there like different varieties though that like sell in like a strawberry stand that lasts as long? But then yes. Yeah, we, we have, well, we don't really grow them anymore, but there are absolutely varieties that used to, when I first started uh, in the business 100 years ago, there was a variety called Chandler that was like, the best, but it just cannot compete in today's world because it's, it, it won't. We actually grew a, a variety, we grow it in Santa Maria right now. It's called Albion. It's a really high flavor, awesome variety, but it just won't. Um, uh, the other thing we forgot was cheap. Um, uh, we, we cannot grow that variety and pay the kind of monies out that I just showed you. Because the problem in agriculture today is, oh man, I gotta get hustling. So, so the problem in agriculture today is we, because of those things, let me make this point and then we'll get back to that. So the gist of it is, in order to do what I just said, to, to now I'm in, interfacing with that, with that buyer, whether it's food service or retail, it's 365 days out of there. So now I'm, now, now me and this part of the business is I'm flying to Mexico. I'm working on new varieties. Who was the plant breeder? 
That's right. I'm working out with new varieties. We're seeing if we can't get stuff south of the equator for the winter months. We're working on post-harvest technology to extend D&D. &D. We're doing all those kinds of things so that three, we're working on QR codes that show our varieties to the customer 365 days out of the year. So, so even though I'm collecting a million bucks off of that farm, the real costs of this side of the business, it's about a two to 3% business, which is okay, but agriculture, in, in the big picture, agriculture is about a two to 3% business. Business. And I'm, I gotta like hustle, huh? I screwed up again. Oh, went to sleep like you guys. <laughs> Page down. Yeah, I don't know. Page down. Maybe. Oh, you guys just won the jackpot. <laughs> okay. Let me pull out my, because I was just trying to remember my, uh, my point. Ah, finance. All right. So a lot of the driver of this is finance. So, oh. Um, so, so in, in agriculture, one of the biggest drivers is, is, so if I was the farming guy, right, you can stop right there, go back one second. If I'm the farming person, I told you I need four and a half million bucks, right? So in order to get that four and a half million bucks, I'm going to go to a bank, right? Just like you guys, if you want to get a car. Well, the problem with agriculture is that it rains and it snows and it freezes. It's very unpredictable. So banks, traditional institutions, don't like to lend money to agriculture. So this is like the root cause of like all of the many things we're talking about, right? So because they don't like to lend money to agriculture, their lending rates are one to one. So if you guys, let's hope and pray that each and every one of you is gonna go buy a house someday. And I'm gonna guess, I don't know, but I'm gonna guess the lending rates on a new house are probably 95 to five. You could probably put 5% down and borrow 95% of the rest. In production agriculture, it's one to one. So for every dollar you put in, the banks will put a dollar in, right? So it's a very difficult business to capitalize, right? So that's why in today's world, you don't see venture capitalists. You see a lot of families in business. And that's the, one of the main roots of that is, is that the, the traditional economic systems that we have in the free world don't invest in agriculture except one to one. So, so it's in addition to being high risk, it, part of the high risk is, so in my world, so what that says, because this is what I do for a living, is that the bank is saying, hey Ernie, you better come up with 2.25 million bucks before I put in my 2.25 million bucks, yes. Um, so your company or your business does both the farming and the selling. So yes. since you guys are like vertically integrated, do you guys save money in that sense of like not having a middleman? E yes, because one of the huge burdens that's going away in farming, and I've got to speed up because I've, I've got to involve you guys, is that 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 it's that, that it is such a thin margins business that if I was Ernie Farley Farms to pay a million bucks to have somebody sell it, the, the margins have gone away because it's a because it's a commodity business and because of what's happened in the Garden of Eden, which is the most wonderful place to grow peaches or strawberries or artichokes or lettuce, is it's it's forced some pressure that you can't do that. I forgot all these Chotskys. Um, it's all right. So that's understanding today's business, right? You guys, anybody, you guys probably don't remember Jerry Maguire, right? But that's, there, if you remember anything, that's the takeaway. Today's business, the one that I'm in that I'm telling you to ignore, is show me the money, right? My customer doesn't care how much money I make. Labor, land, and water has gone skyrocketed. 
It's a very difficult, I'm supposed to, 365 days out of the year, I'm supposed to produce flavor for a customer who the middle person is the retail chain who really prioritizes my product less than flavor and more in attributes of beauty, right? So, let's see if I can't, if I time myself right. No, nope, other way. So here's my question. I need you guys to tell me like, what the hell? <coughs> Why are you here? Why are you studying this? Because it's all broken. So what's changing, both in the farming and the sales and marketing, that's gonna break this cycle? Well, I just know like, like my job is trying to break it over and stuff, but like, just transporting the strawberries from this field now to the cooler, everything has to be like enclosed and like refrigerated. And so like, those are, like, I guess, I don't know what the word is, but like environmental things are changing, I think environmental things are changing super rapidly. Yeah. So is there opportunity there? Yeah. What else is changing? There's a push more towards, you see a lot of people pushing towards like organic agriculture, local food, farm fork. So you're looking at that direct market now, trying to avoid that. Uh, that sales commission you were talking about, push it directly okay. to the consumer. How do you get the consumer to care about your product so that you make money while they're still getting your product? All right. What else? Innovation and technology to like reduce the amount of labor. Sure. I've been on a tractor so long. I, you guys have to speak up. Sorry, I can't hear shit. Innovation and technology, so like labor can labor require increases. Kind of along that uh, post-service technology to reach foreign markets. That's what she just said. Ah, yeah. yeah. Foreign markets. Well, export markets. Export markets. Are you saying like sell other than just here? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you're saying the world's getting smaller. What else? Come on, you guys are the future. Like, if we don't come up with these solutions, we're all. You guys are gonna have to change your major this afternoon. <laughs> Yeah. Um, working on changing uh, the food so they last longer, so like biological change. Biological change. Are, are you talking about like genetically modified organisms? <laughs> Who here would purchase a genetically modified organism? No shit. Can I take that photo? <laughs> That's super cool. All right, what else? So wait a minute, so, so you're saying, most of you just raised your hand that you're not afraid of a genetically modified organism. True? Interesting. Um, come again? It's because we understand what it is. And why, how do you understand that? Is that another, somebody just said getting your customer to understand, is, is that another venue? Uh, I don't think it's marketed exactly what's going on. Yeah, but, but, but if you just said you understand what it is and you're going to buy it, that means somebody did their job, right? Interesting. Surprise, surprise, Sam. <laughs> yes? I was going to say uh, spread awareness of how like, hard it actually is to like, spawn. Spread and, like, awareness. Using what tool? I don't know, marketing. Because like, people, like, we're okay with GMO because we're like, you know how hard it is or like... You have to like push forward, but some people are like, no, just like no GMO, but I still want everything perfect, but no GMO, which is, can be difficult. Maybe. Is it that difficult? Because somebody got you guys all over the hump, right? So, so I guess one of the things that, that, um, so we just, I heard technology, I heard awareness. So let me ask you this, does anybody, um, you said local. So I'm gonna pitch out local for a second. Why do people care about local? Let's not say local, but, but let's use them, yeah, like what are the attributes they're looking for in their food that they say local? Okay, so is, are you guys saying then that P 
people may or may not be more interested in their food than in my generation? Yes or no? Why? Well, I guess it doesn't really matter why. Is that a, is that a good thing? And it, for you guys, is it not for me, I'm already out the door, right? Is it a good thing for you guys? Because if people are starting to understand what they're, so somebody said there's a QR code that they can look on the individual package and begin to understand what it is that they're eating. I do that because people are starting to care. Someone just thought like, oh, let's put a sticker with a QR code for no reason it's because people do want to know. People want to know. So it's kind of interesting in a, in a world where we spend almost none of our income on food, societies that spend a lot of income on their food probably know a lot more about their food, probably from a lot of different reasons, some of them socioeconomic, some of them cultural. But we're now starting to have a realization about our food. Is there a huge opportunity for those in agriculture in the future to educate the consumer? And does it have to be in North America? Right? Because there are technologies in today's world. We just said science and technology. There's, there's, in both of these, there's massive changes going on. And quite honestly, they're, they're, they're not changes that I'm working on. They're changes that Gerald showed me about that you guys are working on today. It's like, and I'm being very serious, like I'm not working on them. You guys are, because quite honestly, if I know that it's a problem and I know the solution, it doesn't matter, right? What, what really matters is you guys looking at this systems, you just said too, too far to ship, too not sustainable enough. So, so are you guys saying that like, okay, me growing strawberry using water and labor on the coast of California and shipping them to Wegmans in New York, there might be some sort of way to do that differently? Yes, no? Or should we just continue to do that? Because that's what I'm gonna do. I'm too old, right? But you guys have the opportunity to switch that. Maybe it's growing indoors. Maybe it's growing with some post-harvest technology. Maybe it's using genetics differently. Maybe it's using genetically modified organisms. I don't know. And another huge thing, here, where do you get your food? We already went through it, Wegmans, Safeway, da 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 da. Anybody know about a small company that might have gotten in the retail grocery business recently? Amazon. Right. Amazon. Now, do they have an office here on campus? <laughs> and, and is it, where is that office? Do they have more than one office? Just one that I got. Huh. And that's weird that it's right by the agriculturalists. So, I'm trying to like... You don't have to worry about it. If there are, if there are questions for our speaker, um, I, you know, now, now is the time. So, so yeah, let me, so the point I'm trying to make that like, the, like uh, the, I'm not trying... Let me re let, let me re say the same thing I was trying to say earlier. Is that agriculture? If if I had given this speech five years ago, I'd say run, <laughs> go study electrical engineering, go do something other than agriculture. Today, it is absolutely. Uh, I get more calls from venture capitalists from Silicon Valley than any other like cold calls, you know, we're, we're, we're a, a company that generates a lot of opportunities and we get huge amounts of, yes, go ahead. What are they calling for? What do they, what do they want to know? I, I'm curious to know what these venture capitalists want. So, so that, okay, good point. We know that. Why am I here? What is the point? Why are they calling me? 
because all I can do is tell them the dumb system that I use <laughs> to, to grow strawberries in Santa Maria, California and ship them 4,000 miles away where they're going to throw, by the way, the food system's probably about 60% efficient. So we're gonna pitch 40% of that food before it gets to the consumer in Portland, Maine. And I'm not, I mean, it's, it is still, don't get me wrong, it is still the absolute greatest system to deliver good, healthy food to people in a cheap way, not cheap, in a, in a, in a reasonable way. But those venture capitalists are looking saying, it's 40% inefficient. We have very little data. We have very little means of taking that data. We have very little means of, once we take the data, mining it. We have very little means of using the data to breed. We have very little means of using the data for post-harvest or the trucking from the field. I, I, they're, they're, they're looking at every single thing. And when they do, they're going to be looking for you guys. Because you guys are going to be the ones that are going to be coming up with the answers of how this business works in the next 20 years. It's not going to be us, because all I'm going to do is tell them we plant plants out about 30 miles from here and pick the fruit and put it in a truck and send it to Portland, Maine. Any questions? <laughs> yes. So you sell both organic and conventional. Yes. Markets. I'm just wondering, how do those markets differ? Mm. Um. So the vast majority. So we sell. You know, we sell a lot of organic produce to uh, Costco because you can look up the demographic for a Costco member and we sell very little, as a percentage basis, we sell very little organics to Walmart because you can look up the demographic. So in a current, uh, I'm not trying, I, I guess I am making a statement, but I'm not trying to, currently it seems as if the demographic for folk, people that are interested in, in actually using their spending dollars to purchase organic tend to come from a demographic that has a higher percentage of disposable income than those that don't. Whether that matches, you know, the voting for the dollars oftentimes doesn't match your desires. There could be a lot of people in that demographic that would like to buy organic that don't, but currently that's really one of the big, I don't know if I just answered your question or I just babbled. <laughs> yeah. You have your costs up there, your customers don't care. Yes. What's your differential in, in your costs for getting what they're getting for? You have 44,000 an acre before you touch a fruit. Right. What's the difference when you're producing organic? Mm, that's a good question. It depends on the area, but you can shotgun about, about Shotgun, it's, it's, so, so these are good questions because organic, local, all those things are changing rapidly. As the public, as the public desire to know more about their food increases, a lot of this stuff is becoming more and more important and more and more, the businesses are getting bigger. So I would answer that question. My business partner, I think, spoke to this class last year and I'd say shotgun, about 25% to less cost and about half the production. But I'm not sure I'd put that in ink, even though you're grabbing a pen, because, <laughs> because things are changing really rapidly. And again, there's a lot of bunch of bright young people um, that some of them work for us that graduated a few years ago that are changing that, changing those percentages. A a as it also grows, it, it's, it's becoming a little less, well, because as we grow it and we be, we're making it more affordable, then the Walmart thing percentage is getting bigger because we can afford to deliver it to a demographic that may want to make the choice but doesn't have the expendable income. Right, it's probably just like iPhones or whatever, right? You know, if you don't have the money, then you can't buy it. So, yes. If this is just a commodity, then as I look at the product that, that you brought today, it's got your logos all over it, and 
and nice, you know, really attractive packaging. And it, it, are you not trying to differentiate yourself? Yeah, so we are. Yeah, so so yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, I don't like talking about us individually, but I will because you because you asked. Um, so um, so so our our brand, Good Farms. We 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 because we don't just sell the product, we also grow the vast majority of it. We have a brand where we are. Um, uh, approaching the consumer and and we're we're trying to change lives in agriculture and we're trying to create a discussion so i thought it was really cool you guys talked about gmos the 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 brand of good farms isn't to say we're this is what's right the brand of good farms is to say we think that globally these things are important the things you just talked about sustainability or local or um human rights etc right so so as those things are important and they get put into the food systems the food systems aren't equipped to handle that because remember it's a commodity business so commodity drives costs out well let me ask if there's a, 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 a if there's an economics a business person in the room when costs are getting driven out of the system who what part of the cost of goods sold takes it on the chin the most boy that was probably a very poorly phrased question if costs are getting driven out of the system what part of cost of goods sold takes it on the chin the most what what part of cost of goods sold loses first <laughs> labor right so in a commodity business labor well, or whatever. Labor is a huge issue, and I'm sure many of you. So, part of our good farms is to bring those discussions up. You know, agricultural labor. It's a. It's been a point of discussions for a long time, um, and so so just to that point, like we've we have partnered with the United Farm Workers Union, which is a very traditionally non, quote unquote, partner of production agriculture, to, to address things like labor. And how do, we, how do we change people from being a farm worker to an agricultural professional with a stable life and a, a career tra trajectory? That's the kind of things we're trying to work on. Uh, we, we produce strawberries both organically and conventionally. Somebody asked here why. So we do because we have two different customers. But that doesn't mean that that person who doesn't have the disposable income to spend on the current organic market should be shoved out of that. So how do we then address that to be able to address that consumer's needs? What it really is is addressing in agriculture, in any commodity, commodity it's traded tactically, right? Today, how much do you have? And we're trying to have a discussion of starting to trade it strategically. Okay, you don't, you're, you don't have the ability to pay labor X. How do we change that? Um, you spray pesticides. How do we diminish or change that? You put nitrogen into the groundwater. How do we change or it's so so it might be farming indoors it might be not local it might be farming and it might not be the farmers market it might be farming under what they call um, high, uh, control ultra UCE ultra controlled environment which isn't a greenhouse it's actually going into an absolutely closed environment and farming it so without pesticides, with recycled water, with robots, who knows, right? But that's the idea of the good farms is, it's not necessarily the answer you may think, but it's trying to drive the questions to come up with different answers. Yes? This is just my hypothesis. Yes. Most people don't really know or understand organics from conventional but what they have is fear of the fees So for most people, this is, for most people, organic is a way for them to feel they have trust. Mm -hmm. So if a brand can create trust independent of whether or not it's supplying organic, is that enough to win and meet the pressures on land costs and water costs and labor costs? It's like, mm -hmm. well, what is it you're selling? And, and, and it's trusted the food system really where people are going. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. I, that, that's something I think we're counting on somewhat is to try to get the consumer. We're actually, what we're trying to do is not get the consumer to say, trust us because we're perfect. What we're trying to do is say, let's get the consumer to trust us that there's a lot of problems. Well, the, the, somewhere along the line to make money, they have to trust your brand irrespective of what. Yes. Uh, Right, and, and what becomes difficult in the in the business of agriculture is that, like you had mentioned earlier, Driscoll's. Well, Driscoll's does a good job of trying to create a brand, but it's really hard to create a brand because every time you eat a Snickers bar, you know exactly what the experience you're going to have, right? Well, with production agriculture, it's very difficult to create that similar experience at all times. So, so part of the hiccup is just being able to interface with the consumer on a 365 day a year basis with a similar experience, the eating experience, it's super difficult to do. Driscoll's does an awesome job. Kudos to Driscoll's. Yes? Do you think, like, so can I ask you a question? Can I ask everybody a question? Do you guys think there's room to grow in the value added side of the berry business? You guys do? <laughs> What's that? All right, so okay, you guys, yes or no? Is there room to grow in the value added side of the berry business? Yes or no? Yes? All berries or just strawberries? All berries. I don't care. I'm looking for somebody to say yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's a great idea. So if I'm going to add value like what you just said, what am I going to use to add that value? Right now. Packaging. Packaging. That's plastic. Shame on you. <laughs> what else? It's like they sell like frozen like do something really chop it up. Chop it up, chop it up how? Like cauliflower and cauliflower rice. Like there's What's that? They, yeah, they have like cauliflower and they made it in cauliflower oh, rice. Right. So so they, they chop cauliflower. So so I'm gonna do it in the berry business. So so first of all, plastic, shame on you. Then I'm gonna chop it up. Who's gonna chop it up? Who's gonna chop it up? Uh, more labor. More labor. Shame on you. <laughs> then where am I going to do it? In my plant where? <laughs> that I haven't built where? And a place that has really high. <laughs> right. So shame on you. But the answer is not yes, but hell yes. And I'm waiting for your guys' answers to, because hell yes. <laughs> But I'm looking, who's, you said techno, robots, I think, didn't you say? So, so get to work. <laughs> Plastics need to be replaced, so that's your job. You said labor, so get with him on automation and robotics. By the way, you guys are working on all of this at your strawberry center. And that's why I'm here today. I'm not here to talk to you guys. I'm here to get to know you guys because you're the ones with the answer. So the answer is hell yes. All those things are going to happen. And we're going to use the internet and we're going to use AI to, because we're going to lower the, you just said like your dad has to bring in the product. There's already products being developed that we're going to put on every pallet to measure the pallet to see what environmental interface each individual pallet has before it gets to the cooler and then through the cooler and then to the consumer. Like all of that stuff is already being, it's not quite there yet, but we're working on it. You, not we, you guys are working on it. So the answer is yes, but get to work. <laughs>